going to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet here today, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and of course, extending that respect uh, to those of you that are online with us today. Thanks for joining us. Um, and you are, of course, on the lands of the traditional custodians right the way across Australia. My name's Rosie Hicks. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Research Data Commons. Our purpose is simply to provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. We're funded by the Australian government under the ENCRIS scheme, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. And I think collaboration is the secret source in that name today, as we come together to talk about research translation. And I welcome you to today's leadership series. Um, today's forum, focusing on research translation, is our third event in the 2024 series of panel discussions aimed at equipping decision makers and the interested in academia, government and industry with the tools to address, uh, the discussions to address the major challenges facing us here in Australia. So for the topic of today, Australia has historically ranked low in the OECD rankings for knowledge transfer from research to business. I can see some nodding heads there, that's not news to us. Researchers find it hard to navigate, sorry, the commercialization landscape, resulting in underutilized innovation. We have had initiatives such as Australia's Economic Accelerator, the National Industry PhD Programme, the Trailblazers University Programme, and the expansion of CSIRO's main sequence ventures all driving to reshape our research commercialization landscape. And in fact, the Australian government's 2.2 billion investment in research translation and commercialization aims to put university innovation and industry collaboration at the forefront of our economic recovery. But we know that despite these initiatives, there are systematic barriers that limit the potential adoption and impact of scientific advancements. An ecosystem that fosters collaboration between researchers, government and industry is essential for research translation and for commercialization to flourish. As Australia's research landscape evolves, addressing these challenges is crucial for translating scientific knowledge into tangible societal benefits. Now, I did mention that I worked for the Australian Research Data Commons. National digital research infrastructure, not surprisingly, I'm going to tell you, plays a vital role in supporting research translation. We facilitate connection between industry, government and researchers, allowing them to build on our national data assets and collaborate in secure research environments. We're undertaking several initiatives to address this. The first of these, which has been running for a couple of years, is our translational research data challenges. Addressing risk reduction and resilience, we started with the bushfires data challenge and we're now working on food security. The programme unites researchers, industry and the public sector to tackle major societal challenges, brings together partners, including the Commonwealth and the state agencies, NCRIS facilities, universities, rural research and development corporations, industries, CRCs, NGOs, all of the actors to collaborate to address these data challenges. As I mentioned, that's been going for a couple of years. Uh, more recently in addressing this gap, in fact, just last Thursday, we gathered in Canberra to launch Research Link Australia, which is a new platform, um, a national information platform to enhance the visibility between research, government and industry to catalyze collaborations essential for innovation to flourish. 
It's a pivotal initiative designed to strengthen connectivity and knowledge exchange. Government bodies are very much behind this. How can they interrogate and optimize the system as well? Very new. We're moving into an iterative phase. And I've had some discussions with some of you, initial peaks at the platform. We're very keen to have your feedback. So those are some of the things that we're doing here at the ARDC. But of course, this afternoon, we're going to have a fantastic discussion about initiatives happening across the ecosystem. The challenges in the research and commercialization space are many, the potential benefits for Australia's economy and resilience in generating innovative research, uh, research solutions is substantial. So I'm looking forward, and I'm sure you are too, to hearing the perspectives and insights um, from our informed expert panel this afternoon, and of course, later on during the discussion from those of you in the audience as well. So now I am absolutely delighted to be handing over to our facilitator for this afternoon, um, Professor Jagadish. When Jagadish and I met up earlier, he introduced me to someone, one of the panel speakers, I think, and said we'd known each other for 20 years. I don't think it's quite 20, Jagadish, but it's very close. Um, Jagadish is, is so well positioned to guide us in the conversation this afternoon with his own work for many years at the heart of innovation in the nanofabrication space. In preparing for this afternoon, I did go to your profile. It is somewhat out of date, but most notably, the list of places you've worked is completely dwarfed by the list of achievements. And I, as I said, it's out of date. And to summarize all of those, I have taken just one of them because I think it is a real accolade and captures the spirit. Um, so Jagadish, I'm highlighting your Companion of the Order of Australia, AC, in 2016. And I think it's the description of that that really stands uh, the test of time and is right for this afternoon. So eminent services to physics and engineering, particularly in the field of nanotechnology, to education as a leading academic, researcher, author and mentor and through executive roles with national and international scientific advisory institutions. And of course, at the moment, the president of the Australian Academy for Science. We are tremendously um, grateful and delighted to have you here uh, for the conversation this afternoon. So thank you, Jagadish. And without uh, further ado, I shall hand over to you. Thank you, Rosie, for that kind introduction. And uh, I, all, I welcome colleagues and those are in the room, those are online. And I would also like to take this opportunity to pay my, uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, Gadigal people of the Iwara nation. And I pay my respects to the, their elders past, present and emerging. And I also would like to pay, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which all of you are joining us online as well, as well as also they might acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, those are participating in this uh, leadership uh, series as well. Welcome. And uh, so as Rosie pointed out that the research translation is absolutely critical for the future of our country and the future of the world. And uh, as Rosie also pointed out that uh, the tra research translation, the index of the OECD, we are not uh, really proud to be in the rankings which we are in. But also I can tell you that uh, if you go and look at the economic complexity index prepared by the Harvard uh, University, we are at 74. 74 behind Uganda and above Pakistan. So can you imagine that a country like Australia, that means you know, our, we are so vulnerable as an economy, so dependent on the agriculture and then the resources, and then the services. So that's why whenever there is a pandemic or any issues come up and then suddenly our economy is very vulnerable. That means in this complex index, you don't want it at the highest numbers, you want it at the smallest numbers 
That means our economy is diverse. That means we'll be able to really deal with any changes which are taking place in the world and particularly geopolitical issues or pandemics or any of those, those sorts of things which are happening in the society. We want to have a society which has got economy which is highly complex so that we can thrive as a nation as well. And research is very important for the future of our nation. And again, there also that uh, we are not very proud. Again, there, our R&D investment is in the OECD ranking. We are at the bottom half of the OECD countries at number 2022. 20, 20, so we are not investing as much as we should be in, in terms of research. We are not really translating that research into the outcomes or the in, benefit to the society in terms of industry or government policy or societal benefit of the public good activities as well. But thirdly, we're also economic complexity point of view. We're also at the bottom end of the spectrum as well. So we need to improve on all aspects of it. And then research translation is absolutely critical. And then we've got uh, wonderful panelists here. And uh, those have got a lot of experience in terms of uh, really seeing how to do that research translation. And then they'll be able to share with us their experiences and identify what are the barriers we have and how to get over those barriers in order to be able to achieve the goal of being excellent in terms of research translation. And in addition to also investment in R&D, and that's again, it turns out that the government investment has gone down and then the business investment has gone down. Only sector which has been increasing in R&D investment is the universities. But now of course, universities are at the moment also going through challenging times after COVID as well. So philanthropy is of course, more or less stayed stable at, uh, at a low level. That means there's a need for further investment in R&D by the government. There's also need for industry increasing the R&D investment as well. That means governments have an important role to play in terms of developing the policies, which will encourage the industry to really invest in R&D as well, so that those policies can have an influence so thereby we can move towards the OECD average of about 2.7% is OECD average. We are sitting at 1.68%. Colleagues, 1% 1 gap in R&D investment, which we should not be proud of. And we want to be among the top half of the OECD countries, not the bottom half of the OECD countries. Today's topic is a wonderful topic and I want to congratulate Rosie and Keith and the ARDC team in terms of what are the challenges which we are facing as a country? How do we really enable that research translation? What are the systemic barriers? What the governments can do as a community, what we universities can do and institutions can do. And that's, those are things which we'll be discussing today. And uh, I think now I would like to invite the panelists and uh, Mare Herbs and the, from the UTS. And that means he's hosting us here. He's the director of enterprise at UTS. Mare, please come and join us. So I'm not going to tell about how wonderful these people are. They're all been chosen because of the fact that they got a wide experience. And if you want to know more about uh, how wonderful these people are, just Google their names and you'll find lots of information about what they've achieved uh, during their careers as well. Okay. And also Dr. Jai Lee, Director of Strategy and Alliance, Bio BioNTech Australia. And those of you, those who may not know about BioNTech and we are talk about Pfizer vaccines, in fact, BioNTech Pfizer combination of vaccines and somehow rest of the world called them as a BioNTech uh, Pfizer vaccines and we've somehow dropped the BioNTech, but uh, really delighted to have you here, Jai. And uh, please warmly welcome her. Chacha So Klein, and he's a general manager of the ICT and digitalization uh, of fisheries uh, RDC, Rural De Development Corporation. He's also known as Jojo. And then we'll, for this uh, afternoon's purpose, we'll call him as Jojo. Apparently everybody calls him Jojo. W welcome, please. <laughs> Finally, and uh, Alessandro Lungo, and a program director for Digital Health CRC, Cooperative Research Center as well. Welcome. So as you can see that we got a diverse group of people with the diverse expertise and experience. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is that I'm going to ask them to make a few comments each of, each of you. Then after those comments, and we can really start the discussion about uh, give the, open the floor 
and then you can ask questions and people online also can ask questions. And uh, Robin here is going to help me in terms of asking questions for uh, the online uh, audience as well. With that, Mare, please go ahead and introduce yourself and, uh, your, your, and what you see as uh, the barriers which we are facing in terms of research translation. Keep in mind that the data has the role of the data as well, because this is under the NCRIS program of ARDC. And, uh, and data, of course, as all, I don't have to tell you about the importance of data and already Rosie has spoken about it. And uh, it's interesting that the data used to be behind everything which we are doing, because that's the evidence which we are looking for in terms of research, but now really come out of the behind to the real limelight, because everybody is talking about data, big data, analytics, and data science. And in fact, many universities are also starting them, you know, started many courses in data science or so. In itself, data has become a discipline in its own right and has a very, very important role to play in terms of the future of the decision making, future of our industries, future of our society as well. With that, please, Mari. Thank you very much. Uh, if I get a round of applause, you definitely get a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, under Spotlights. Thank you for joining us at UTS. Uh, raise your hand if you're a UTS person. Okay, there's always so many UTS people in these kind of rooms. Uh, I'm Murray Herbs. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship for UTS. So we have the largest entrepreneurship program in Australia that is inspiring and supporting tech-enabled entrepreneurs. Uh, and I'll just say a couple of things really quickly that might be slightly provocative and might help the conversation. Uh, and this warning, I'll, I'll mention AI. So, yes. Uh, my background, so I started a company when I was 16. It was a internet filtering company. It grew over 15 years to 100 million users at its peak. So I did a lot in kind of browser modification things. Was running Westpac's data-focused accelerator. Was building fish burners from 100 desks to 750. So a big incubator network across Australia. And then six years at UTS running entrepreneurship here. So that's the kind of entrepreneurship angle I can bring. I uh, also ran Startup Muster since 2013. So that's the biggest survey of startups across Australia. And entrepreneurship is changing. So particularly with the background in browsers. So what is happening now in browser automation is really, really interesting. And this will make sense in a second. But as like the opportunity to say, put this on eBay into a browser as a single kind of string instruction, and for it to open eBay, create an account, create a listing, deal with buyers, go through all of that, or to create an e-commerce website or create whatever kind of thing or find a supplier for this kind of thing. That kind of browser automation is currently like reasonably possible. There's different benchmarks that show it at like 30% effectiveness compared to like 80% for a human uh, across a particular benchmark suite. And that's rapidly increasing. And the cost is quite high at the moment, but it's coming down because of the visual models that it needs. So give it six months, I think, and then think about what changes that will make in entrepreneurship in Australia and around the world. So those kind of low barrier to entry e-commerce sites or normal kind of online businesses will suddenly be overwhelmed with AI generated kind of solutions, uh, either by humans using the tools or by the tools using the tools. And then think about that. What does that do to entrepreneurship and what people need <laughs> to start interesting companies. Like obviously the bar is raised higher and higher in terms of the enablers that you need to be an interesting kind of entrepreneur, whether it's the capital behind you or the networks, or I think increasingly commonly the skills and the research networks that you have to bring that kind of differentiating IP and expertise into play. So I think that's part of the reason for why this conversation matters uh, and why I love the ARDC and the work that you're doing. The, the other reason is, uh, according to Startup Muster data, so the big survey of startups across Australia, uh, the 2018 survey showed 6% of startups were started by someone with a PhD. And we took a little break from the survey. We came back in 2023, uh, obviously post-pandemic, and that number had gone to 16% of startups being founded by people, people with a PhD. And I am pretty sure I've never seen in any research commercialization metrics a mention of how many people have left academia and started companies and took their expertise in a non-formal commercialization pathway into new companies. So I think that will increasingly be a more normal pathway, especially when universities are under the threat that they are at the moment, um, of people taking their expertise and starting new companies. So I think that's an area to appreciate more. 
I think the, the last thing I'll mention is how interesting data is getting. So when I was at Westpac doing the data focus accelerator and we're looking at like, what are the interesting data sets that Westpac and other people have and how does that enable certain companies? The consistent limitation was the signal to noise in large data sets and how feasible it was to turn that into useful information. AI again, uh, because there's always been kind of interesting data sets around who's doing what kind of research. This in Research Link Australia is the most compelling data set that I've seen in terms of being university supplied and pulling in research kind of funding collaborations as well, the kind of partnerships. Not just making it available, but now the tools being available for interesting entrepreneur with a grasp of AI to turn that into, okay, here are the people I need to work with to turn this into something that otherwise would not be possible. So there is an emerging need for more kind of capabilities and differentiation in entrepreneurship. Uh, there will be this kind of flood of people that are required to do that. There will be more people leaving universities and starting companies of their own. And there will be a consistent link, I think, to ARDC and Research Link Australia in particular as the data set that enables us to do that. How does that sound? Okay, seeing nods. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Murray. We'll come back in terms of uh, in terms of your comments about the PhDs, the number of PhDs, those are going and starting companies is increasing. That's wonderful news. And we'll come back and afterwards we'll ask a question about are we training our PhDs to be entrepreneurship ready so that they just don't become like academics and they can also find opportunities to be able to be entrepreneurs and be able to start companies or so, which will come back. Please. Yeah, yes. Um, thank you. And um, a real shout out to ARDC, Rosie Heath. Thanks, thanks so much for coordinating this and providing us the opportunity to be here. It's a really important topic of trans translation. Um, I do need to have a disclaimer here. I'm here as a private capacity. So my views are the views of, of my own and doesn't it's not a reflection of the company that I work for. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to highlight that it's important these days for researchers to be not just interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary in their approach, in their engagement with um, uh, industry with engagements with different partners and stakeholder in that innovation ecosystem. So uh, in terms of my background, I started life 15 years as a research virologist, also a diagnostic virologist. And then um, I did an MBA and I, I kind of left the research world much to the horror of my colleagues. They, they basically said I sold my soul and went off to the dark side. Um, and then went into technology startup. Um, one day I was looking down the microscope, looking at cells. The next day I'm managing um, a team of um, computer software engineers uh, developing a web-based enterprise grade uh, software uh, and also selling that um, software to um, customers in the pharmaceutical and also in the medical uh, research environment. Uh, and then I went and progressed uh, to work for a Victorian government, Department of Health, wrote policy papers and um, the Victorian government's health and medical research strategy. I was a lead author for that, and it's a public document, 2016-2020. Um, and also I was uh, director of health and life sciences. It's a commercialization uh, team with um, National ICT Australia. That's an ARC center of excellence, what's now called Data 61 CSIRO. But what I'm um, trying to communicate here is that that journey, my career isn't linear like that of an academic. You start off, you know, level A, B, C, D, and E. It's a bit of a zigzag. And when I explain it to people, it's almost a spaghetti. Um, in, in actual fact, no recruiter would touch me because they like, you know, round pegs in a, in a round hole. They don't know what to do with someone like myself. But I have deliberately chosen this particular pathway to allow me to be able to traverse the language of not just medical research, traverse the language of industry, of technology, of policy, of government, so that when I um, have those conversations with these stakeholders, uh, we are on the same page. We are singing off the same song sheet. Um, it, we shouldn't be having conversations, you know, like ships passing through across the, the night and missing points. We, we need to have common touch points. 
And so I would encourage researchers to learn um, to have interest in the stakeholders that you would not normally uh, engage with. Learn the language of government, learn the language of venture capitalists, of industry that you are working with, so that uh, you understand the value of the industry that you're working with. If it is an AI industry, but you're not you're not really in that AI sector, you might be in medical research using a lot of data that is applicable to the AI sector. Uh, I would say learn that learn about digital health, uh, companies that are working in that digital health space, and so on. So I think that um, research translation we have a rich ecosystem with. Uh, robust opportunities to tap into different stakeholders from, from venture capitalists right through to uh, industry, global partners, startups, and so on. Um, and I would encourage uh, you to learn the tools that are on, on offer here in Australia. And research translation is a journey, uh, and it's an ongoing journey for you. And it's, it's very exciting once you start on that journey. Okay. Thank you, Joey. We'll come back to you again also on, in terms of your career journey and then what you will change in the system in order to be make life better for the next generation. Thank you. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, Joe. Oh, thanks. i uh, just like to uh, uh, say how old I am to be uh, with this esteemed panelist uh, here. Uh, um, Jojo Silva, I'm the general manager of ICT and digitalization at Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. We're one of 15 uh, research and development corporation that's been set up uh, as part of the PERD Act, which is the Primary Industry Research and Development Act, which takes the uh, gross value production of agriculture production to invest back into research. We talked about the value of the government research. This is the uh, industry and government putting in money to research uh, into the agriculture where we look after the aquatic space fisheries, uh, one of the 15. Um, and my role has been, I've come through the, uh, the IT uh, I guess channel of the uh, the role, not as spaghetti as JE uh, as, uh, but it has transformed quite significantly to the point where I don't really touch technology that much. But uh, we talked about the importance of data and digitalization uh, to the point where a new business unit was set up in FRDC to actually look after more of the technology and digital and data side of our investments and partnership, which is not traditionally there to begin with. What I wanted to bring to this uh, panel here is that uh, we tend to say that what we do is we invest in research and development. And one of the roles that we have is what we call a knowledge broker, right? So we invest in knowledge, not just pure research, but a lot of knowledge. And that knowledge, if it just sits on its shelf as reports on, it's not doing it what it needs to do. And then Jay mentioned about uh, a non-linear pathway. Uh, research to commercialization or research adoption extension, however, whichever path you want to uh, take, usually it's described in very linear terms, right? Say, okay, you do the research, there's a development, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's very unidimensional, right? So you either get to the endpoint or not. But I view it as sort of two-dimensional, like at each point, right? So you have the research and there's a question of whether you're aware of the research or not. And then from the awareness, do you end up developing it or do you trial it? Do you create an IP in the commercialization sense? And how do you then develop from that IP, so on and so forth? And at each stage, there could be multiple, uh, like a pathway that you can split out on and each individual step there, or even before that, their role for data to help inform how best to actually navigate that maze. And you could even look at it from uh, expanding from the two dimension to the three dimension in the sense where different type of research will have different type of overall awareness, development opportunity. Uh, Murray said like, depending on what the, I guess, piece of knowledge that's being created will have commercialization opportunity or not that leads to a startup. And, more likely than not, it will be the combination of multiple ones that's been done over different time periods that needs to come together to make that secret ingredient, right? There's a, uh, uh, Mariana Masticato in her book uh, made a really good point about a lot of these government funded research that's been 
that's gone into these high risk ventures and these basic research that at much later date comes out to be really successful commercial products. He took the uh, example of the iPhone, for instance, the GPS is government funded, even the, uh, the, the touchscreen from the Xerox uh, Park, for instance, so on and so forth, right? So how, I, I guess my, uh, the, the, the takeaway point is that what we should be doing with the knowledge and the research that we're funding is to treat it like a product, right? So in, internally at FRDC, I say that, hey, we, we fund research and knowledge. We need to see it as a commercial business that produces a product and we're trying to sell it. It just so happens that what we're producing is knowledge and research and the price is usually free, right? We're, we're letting it out there. And we still need to, we can't just sit on our laurels because it's free and it's not a revenue source, sit there. We want to be able to keep pushing it so that more people are aware of it, more people can use it. Even if it cannot be used, have a feedback loop that comes in so that it will inform future research, right? And that would kickstart a, uh, a feedback loop that could actually help us produce more uh, fit for purpose, I suppose, uh, research that's uh, more impactful for both the country industry and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank, thank you, JJ. We'll come back again to you as well. Thank you. Yeah. Good. We are an island, island nation. That means we've got a lot of marine resources. How effectively we're using those marine resources is a worthwhile mm -hmm. discussion to have. Thank you. Alexandro. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Also, very uh, thankful for you guys having me here today. And uh, how's it going on the panel with such esteemed, esteemed others? Uh, so, in preparing for this panel, we wrote down three words um, about research translation discoverable, influential, and collaborative. So hopefully those three words, you've already resonated. I think everyone's touched on them to some degree, but that's the digital CRC strategy around translation is to make sure research and outputs from our research are discoverable, influential, and have collaboration in mind. So we can talk to some examples of that a bit later on. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alex Longo. I started my career as an allied health professional. Um, so I worked in there for several years, but early in my career, uh, moved into digital health projects where I was part of um, some national and state projects, uh, one of which included the, the first time there was collection and de-identification and aggregation of general practice data in healthcare, which we used to develop a quality improvement framework and program that uh, worked across um, firstly in my area that I was working and then transpired across five other areas. So we were effectively in about 500 general practices. So some of you may have been treated by a doctor who was reflecting on their own data for the first time and trying to improve their own practice through some of the work we did in my early career. Um, currently, I'm at the Digital Health CRC in the role of Program Director. So I oversee a pipeline of um, R&D projects, as well as supporting our commercial and translation arm of our organization, which are, which are core elements. Um, so you can't really do research. So there's no translation or commercialization. You want to you have an output, so what? Um, so one of the things I was thinking in the light rail on the way here today was um, with uh, root cause analysis, you've got the five whys. You try to look backwards and you say, you know, why, why, why? Why did something happen? But if you look forwards, you should probably do like the five so what's of research. So you don't want to just do exploratory research. You want to say, so what? How can I get it out there? We found this great discovery. We've got this great little solution working. So what? How do I get it in front of the user? How do I get it commercialized? How do I get it sustainable? Make sure it's desirable, feasible, viable, in everything that we do. So, um, I think the message that I want to make, and I won't be much longer up here, is that when we establish our research projects or when we're endeavoring to, to explore in the world, we think about whatever the output is, wherever we find, to make sure that it's discoverable at the end of the day. It can be influential. So whether that's a public good, whether it's a commercial benefit, that it can be used in a collaborative format. So if we're collecting data or putting something out there in the world, um, it doesn't have to be given away for free. That's true. Um, but when we collect it or when we produce it, let's have in mind that there may be some commercial outcomes. There might be a public good outcome that we're trying to achieve and bake that into what you're trying to do from the very start. Um, quite often, we're just looking to what's in it for me. So you've got collaborative work between government, industry, universities, and people like us, enablers in the, in the ecosystem. And we're all thinking about what's in it for me. Um, to bring that on the, on the table right at the start, make sure everyone's saying the same language, as you mentioned, Jayi. No, no point being ships in the night while you're in this 
million dollar plus project together, trying to figure out where we're heading. Get that on the table early and um, decide where we're trying to take this ship. Good. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alexander. It's good to see that all of you have reflected on different aspects of it, but also you have pointed out the importance of learning the language and being able to adopt ourselves to be able to changing conditions which you're dealing with at that moment and also resilience. And again, you mentioned as some of you have mentioned as well. So maybe Murray, you mentioned about PhDs really, number of PhDs, it's a good thing that number of PhDs are going and then starting companies, that's a good, good sign. And uh, in the universities, do you think that uh, we are training PhDs uh, be ready for, be able to do start companies or entrepreneurship and then be able to take that uh, jump of comfort zone of uh, being doing a researcher and publishing papers to really go and start a company and commercialize technologies and then what's your thoughts on that one uh it's a really interesting area sorry for getting my phone out i was just writing some notes on what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> but the uh martin bleemel for example at uts has some research from a while ago around entrepreneurial self-efficacy and the kind of confidence of entrepreneurs and as you teach people more about entrepreneurship they want to do it less so there is a <laughs> interesting balance to strike of if you just say, let's put all PhDs through some kind of entrepreneurship programming, that's probably not going to have the result that people expect. But if you think more about what are the academic promotion criteria or what kind of um, leave opportunities people have in going in and out of industry, what kind of recognition do you have for that in the people that you hire inside a university? Um, even out to UTS has some interesting examples. We've got an entrepreneurial PhD that is just launching now where the artifact is company rather than what it would otherwise be. And that's interesting as a kind of gateway into PhD land in a way that is designed from the start to create companies instead. But I think that's more about giving people permission to do something rather than educating them on how to do it. Uh, and giving the incentive for it and attracting people into that PhD that want to do that as well. Um, it's interesting that the things that people choose to pursue as entrepreneurs are often uh, passion driven. So you, you like working on this particular thing or you're already doing something and then you're kind of forced to find a way to make it viable. I think there's a real strong parallel with why people do research in certain areas. Um, and it's very hard to kind of overlay commerciality on that. If you're relying on the passion of people and their own desire to generate new knowledge for that to happen, it's almost impossible, I think, to make that a commercial consideration from the start. Um, I think the, the one kind of consistent solution is just having more people doing it, make it more socially kind of normal, the peer pressure of that and changing organizations in the form of universities and government programs by this having a larger weight of PhDs doing this kind of work. I think that is an easier way to drive change than a specific program to change what they do. Okay, uh, thank, thanks, Maria. Of course, there's still a lot, work, lot of work need to be done where people can go from the universities to industry and be able to come back if they want to come back. And as many of you know, the Australian Research Council has created this industry fellowships, so future fellowship and laureate fellowships. When I go and look at the success, successful people, most of them are academics, those who got interactions with industry, not many people from industry are able to come back into the universities. That's still a challenge for us as a sector because we are already going and looking for their papers and other things. But people, those who are working in industry are not going to publish papers in nature or science. And of course that they can do, but lots of times they're focusing on productization and product development and taking patents and other things. And I think we need to really remove that barrier so that the flow of information is people are able to move from university sectors to uh, the industry and industry people are also coming back to the you know, university sector. That way also cross-fertilization cross of ideas. And then also that people, those who have got that experience in the academic systems, they be able to mentor people. And then also particularly some people, those who want to be passionate about commercialization or entrepreneurship, they can learn from the people with the lived experience that will be very valuable for you know, both the sectors as well. Thank you, Marit. And Jai, you're, you want to really express uh, some, particularly you put up your hand and wanted to say something about this particular aspect of it. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, so in academia, where I'm seeing is that there's a strong appetite in a lot of universities coming up with entrepreneurship commercialization programs. So I've been with the University of Melbourne, I recently exited from the University of Melbourne in my role as sort of enterprise professor in MedTech. And University of Melbourne, um, 
right throughout the program have their Melbourne Accelerator program. They have uh, the Translating Research at Melbourne program called the TRAM program. These are opportunities to um, for researchers, junior researchers, senior researchers, uh, and as well as PhD students to really uh, learn the entrepreneurial skill sets. And they're all free courses. So I'd encourage anyone. Um, so CSIRO has their own program. I also know UNSW has their founders program. Uh, so all these universities now are seeing the true value of entrepreneurship. And within uh, various universities themselves, they will run master classes. So at University of Melbourne, I used to run master class in Business Model Canvas, for example. Uh, the university also has been running as part of their Masters of Engineering, the Biodesign Innovation course. And that's modeled on the Stanford Biodesign course. It's been very successful because the students, the master's students who are part of that course, um, a lot of them have gone out and spun out their own company. So I think that course has generated probably more than 10 startups and a um, significant number of them have received uh, multi-million dollar investments. So I, I think um, academia is seeing that value of that entrepreneurship uh, journey, wanting to equip and uh, really give that holistic um, Kind of skill sets to uh, the academic cohort, whether they're master students, undergrads, or um, whether they're PhDs. Okay, uh, th thank you, Jai. And I think you've got your, uh, you know, you call it a non-linear career you mentioned about, and uh, so you got a broad experience of working in industry in the university sector and also government policy sector. So, what do you change in terms of government policy? in terms of being able to really enhance this translation, which uh, we have been talking about research translation for a long time. We got programs for 30 plus years, but with, despite all those things, we are not able to move the dial. It's just sitting there, stuck there. We're not able to really make progress in that one. So what do you change as a government policy or the university's policy in, term, in order to be able to make this to happen much more an accelerated pace? Yeah, I think that um, for, for Australia, it's it's a natural um, question to ask is, you know, looking to government to provide some of those answers to, you know, increase funding. Uh, what are the other levers that government can use? So they have the R&D tax incentive programs. How can we better make that program more effective in um, engaging industry, attracting industry to do that collaboration with researchers and so on. So there are multiple programs that you've mentioned that uh, ARC now has introduced in a, as part of the industrial transformation program and a industry fellowship scheme that allows um, people from uh, research to partner with industry to spend maybe you know, 20 20% 20 of their time uh, being housed at industry, but also a scheme that allows the reverse for people from industry to, to actually enter academia so that there is that cross-learning and cross-fertilization of opportunities. Um, so I think governments continually look to evolve uh, their programs. So the MRFF, for example, they have a whole range of frontier uh, initiatives. NHMRC has a, a whole range of industry engagement opportunities as well. But um, more to the point is how do we as researchers and also in industry um, initiate the dialogue and initiate that engagement um, because ultimately we need to come together to access those funding. Uh, and the, the way that I, when I was at University of Melbourne, I was initially brought in because university, the Faculty of Engineering and IT were very keen to develop a program where um, there was, uh, they were looking to increase their cat, what they call category two to category four uh, research income. Um, and in order to do that, that means that category two to category four is basically anything that is non-NHMRC, non-ARC. It's really about industry engagement, uh, any external funding from state, your respective state governments, philanthropy, and so on and so forth. Now, that requires a, a specific um, strategic uh, initiative and strategic program to actually encourage and provide impetus to our researchers to want to go and, and do non-CAT1 um, uh, research. 
Um, and so how do we do that? And one of the ways we did that was to really encourage academics to think about, well, you need to consider your five-year roadmap. Think about who are the industry sectors that are really the industry and within the partners within that industry sector that you can partner with. Understand that industry landscape. So if you are in the mining sector and you are using data uh, that might be attractive to the mining sector, who are the key mining industry sectors? Now, people naturally then um, gravitate towards the global mining companies like um, Rio Tinto and, and the likes. But in Australia, we, the engine room are really the small, medium-sized enterprises. They're the engine room for us, not necessarily um, the global uh, companies. And so it's mapping that landscape. There's a global companies that you could potentially uh, engage with, but who are the, even in the mining sector, for example, who are the SMEs that you can engage with? So that's one thing, identifying potential partners. The other thing is, can you speak the language of those partners? And when I mean by the language of the partners, it's to say, can I um, introduce and be able to understand the value that I bring to that industry? It's not talking about my capability. It's not talking about my expertise. It's using a different language. Ah, I understand that these are your gaps. These are your problem areas. Let me talk about how I can add value to where to address your gaps. Because very often we go to the, our comfort zone, we talk about our expertise. And often we use the language of, I'm, I'm one of the world leading researchers in all of that. Companies don't need to know that you're world leading. They've done their homework on you, right? And in this global village of ours, they can source capability and expertise in any part of the world. Um, but of course, if you're an Australian company, it would be easier to actually source capability within your own country. So that language of how do I speak their language? How do I communicate that I can add value? And it's often not about um, a solution looking for a problem. We, we're often very good at saying, oh, I've got this solution and I've got this amazing technology for you. And then you realize there's a mismatch. That's not what the company is looking for. So I'll leave that yep. at that. Thank you, Jay. Very insightful comments. And then Jojo, you're really leading this fisheries RDC. Yes. And uh, as I mentioned that, uh, you know, we have the big, you know, whenever I go to Hawaii and I always tell people that when they say that there's a big island, I say that I'm from the big island. You know? yeah. so that's a real big island here. We've got an enormous amount of marine resources surrounding us. Yeah. Are we really making use of those marine resources in a sustainable way? And then also that sure, are we translating that one into industries which will benefit the nation and again, making sure that it's done in a sustainable way. All right. Uh, yes, we do have a huge amount of, I guess, marine estate. Australia is blessed with that. But unfortunately, the marine state that we've been blessed with is a bit barren. The South African, okay, so I could be wrong here, so the South African sardine industry alone would be bigger than the whole of Australia combined. It's because we're just not very productive, just because of how the, the uh, I, I guess the, uh, the ocean works. But what it does is that it creates a lot of unique products that are of higher value. We don't produce a lot of single uh, products, but a lot of uh, different products that are of higher value. If you take our abalones, for example, uh, for instance, and our rock lobster, for instance, they're one of the, the, the world's highest uh, highly coveted, highest value products that we have. The question about sustainability, Australia ranks now one of the world's best at managing our uh, marine resources sustainably, right? Uh, in the wild capture one, there's always the, uh, the, the, the cap on what nature can produce. We're harvesting sustainably uh, compared to uh, a lot of the other different countries combined. But as with a lot of food production, that's happening throughout the world, we're being challenged by needing to produce more food for a growing population. And the current, even the current population, 10% is nutritionally challenged, right? So they still need to be fed. And let alone the, uh, 
the growing affluence and the 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 the, the, the affluent wanting a different type of more protein rich diet, for instance, right? How do we produce more food or even if it's the same amount of food with less impact on the world, right? We've got uh, climate change happening, which is one of the negative externalities where we thought that we could just burn fossil fuel without any consequences and we keep doing that, right? So now we have these challenges where we need to produce food. Otherwise, hey, we could just make Australia, feed Australia, but that's fine. But there's still the whole rest of the world. Yes, Australia produces the high value food and one could argue that it doesn't uh, impact a lot on the nutritionally challenge. But where Australia does have a role to play in terms of research is that we talk about net zero, et cetera, right? So we want to get like uh, Australia, big landmass, small population, uh, per capita, we might be a bit high, but if we go to net zero, how much impact will that have globally, right? But same with the food production and also uh, our, I guess, carbon reduction, the know-how, the research that will go into how we can do these things better becomes something that we can export. And that, the, that kind of type of translation of better managing the natural environment while producing food would be the really big impactful stuff that we should be focusing on and moving away from just like Jagadish said, Australian colony is largely uh, resource-based, either it's mining or agriculture, right? If we need to move away from that, it is, right, yes, we're strong in these areas. How can we leverage whatever strength that we currently have and to become more of a, a, a diversification towards that other areas of strength, which could be the technology that could be built upon how to do things better and also be able to, I guess, help the world at the same time. Okay, thank you, Jeju. Very insightful comments. And then Alexandro, we talk about digital health and what are the privacy challenges when you're dealing with the digital health? And the second thing is also that a lot of data has been really captured at the government level state governments and federal level or so, what are the barriers which you see in terms of being able to make sure that the privacy of the individuals has been maintained while we're able to do things which are for common good and which will benefit the entire community? Uh, hit the nail on the head, it's, it's a massive topic in, in healthcare. Uh, so principally, I think we're talking about data here, many will be familiar with the five safes and the, and the fair data principles. So I think fundamentally, that's where the starting point is, um, particularly when you're into health, health data, you're dealing with potentially sensitive information. Um, so everyone has health data. Everyone probably recognizes that the health data that they have for themselves could help someone else out there. So you've got a health record, you've got challenges that you've been through, your outcomes could inform better outcomes for someone else. So principally, I think everyone understands that. However, the social license to use people's health information for secondary purposes is a challenging one. So do we ever get to that stage where it's actually usable? Um, firstly, you follow the principles, five saves, fair data, et cetera. Um, then quite often we're just identifying our data whilst it's in its silo. So for it to leave your general practice or your hospital, quite often it's gonna be de-identified before it gets sent anywhere else. So it's again, safe and secure. Next, how do you want, we, we're trying to link data sets nowadays. So New South Wales is um, got tender that recently with Epic to get a single digital patient record for all of New South Wales. So at every hospital you go to is using the same computer, so to speak, same health record that they can see. A lot of people will think that once you go to your GP and you go to your hospital, the hospital should know the information that you just told your GP. Why am I repeating myself five times? So there's this balance between what people want versus protecting their data and their information. And that's a big challenge in Australia. We've also then outside of states is the national level. So our DC definitely collects and, and has various registers that, that people can access for, for population health data sets. Um, but again, how can you link that data to other data sets to make it more meaningful to generate better value for it? So that's one of the, the key barriers, um, I guess, is maintaining privacy to, and whilst also making data as usable and as valuable as possible. Um, I think what the opportunity is in, in that and what the CRC sees as an opportunity is is in the data governance processes. So one of the biggest barriers in the research that we conduct is the time to actually getting that safe, secure, 
and meaningful data in the hands of researchers or industry so they can use it meaningfully to develop products to benefit the population and their customers. Um, so we've got projects that you know take a full 12 months when you put in an application before you can actually get your hands on any data set. Um, and that's probably a, a good time frame, to be honest. Um, so better data governance practices, automated data, data governance, a national approach to how healthcare data is managed, accessed, and um, you know, taken care of once it is in the right hands, um, I think is where the opportunity lies and something that the ARDC, the CRC, all of us can, can be a part of. Good, okay. Thanks, Alessandro. I think now we'll open the floor for questions, either online or in the room. Any questions from the, for the panel? I asked you to ask questions, not to leave the room, you know? <laughs> Please, go ahead. Yeah. Question, okay, just just can you just wait for one second? Please tell your name and then ask the question, please, from where you come from as well. Thank you. Yes. And with a microphone. Yeah. Hi, Luke from UNSW. The microphone works. That's better. Um, cheeky question around data and AI and where we're heading next with open science. So talking to some of my researchers at UNSW, especially those much more on the entrepreneurship involved researchers at the moment with IP concerns. One, they've got IP concerns. That's normal when we've had to deal with that for the last few years. But even more so, putting some of their data into places where AI might take actions on those data. So I was wondering if that's something that you, you've been thinking about as well. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Jay, please go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question because, um, and UNSW has a terrific AI institute uh, as well. So I think where uh, AI is heading um, at the moment, uh, the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science and Resources has a public consultation piece on looking at what are the guardrails for AI in high risk settings. So that's open to the public. I'd encourage you all to have a look uh, at that consultation piece. Uh, if you'd like to respond, it closes on the 4th of October. But it gives you an, an indication of um, where there is considerable angst uh, in, the, in the public arena, in society, in government, and even in industry about what are some of uh, the, the misuse or some of the challenges with uh, technology, uh, such as that are being used in AI. Um, AI can come up with, and it's, it's, it's the challenge is also about the quality of those data sets. So um, it's not just about uh, one type of data sets. We're now seeing data sets coming in that uh, are predictive if it's coming from your smartwatch, uh, it's coming from your health records, your genomics at the molecular level, all of the multiple layers of data. How do you standardize those data? How do you curate and annotate those data sets? Uh, making sure, as, as uh, Jagadish, you mentioned, you know, it's not that garbage in, garbage out. Uh, how and and can you um, make meaning, meaningful action, meaningful actions out of the data sets? And that requires um, the algorithms that are, um, and AI plays a role in that. Natural language processing plays a role. Machine learning uh, plays a role in that. But there are all challenges that as a platform and an, as a software application, it's evolving. Uh, and we need to come up with uh, ways and means to address uh, those potential harms and the, the risks that might come out of that. I'm not sure whether I'm directly answering your question, but there's some of the challenges. <coughs> so, 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 my, my, stress is, my stress is that with, we're losing data to open science. Yeah the researchers are no longer choosing to put more sensitive IP laden data into open repositories. They weren't before, they're even more going to stop doing so now. I'm not saying open science is dead. I'm saying it needs to be thought through with an AI lens on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. Oh, time. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Are there any questions online? So, so any further questions in the room? 
obviously everybody is want to have a coffee break that's what he's trying to remind me that, that please go ahead you know yeah, yeah please go ahead Murray. sorry in five seconds yeah sure please do no, really interesting yeah. twist on that that we spent 30 years basically putting the world's knowledge on the internet and then that's been hoovered up and created these models that will benefit us hopefully in a larger extent compared to what we lose so I think any that will have a chilling effect on any open data things. I think the next step will be interesting of what happens to the patent system, for example, when there is an influx of new ideas being created and explored and documented in a way that's like close to zero incremental cost. Um, I think that's the, the bigger thing to worry about rather than a particular data set. So how do researchers work in that environment when there's IP being generated all over the place based on this kind of huge body of information that is sent out. So uh, I, I would encourage them to worry about that more. Okay, thank you, Murray. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you give, I know that you want to make coffee break. We'll just ask mm -hmm. uh, one more question. Yes. Look, I've got a question for the whole panel. Um, what, at what stage in your, I suppose, research careers, whether it was education through to the careers that you've had now, did you first think about research translation? Is this something that you were confronted with when you went through tertiary education, when you were putting together your first PhDs or projects, whatever it was, when did you first have to think about that? Okay, Jay, please. I can have a go with that. So I um, was exposed to uh, the pharmaceutical industry during my postdoc. So the, my research into uh, hepatitis B, uh, my supervisor was doing a lot of contracts with pharmaceutical companies trying to identify what are the potential um, opportunities up to create new drugs to alleviate uh, some of the um, challenges that comes with uh, experiencing chronic hepatitis B. So that gave me a, a taste of what it was like to engage there and also a taste of working under a regulatory kind of uh, ISO environment because um, my supervisor uh, was a student enough to realize that in order to attract contracts with uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, it would be great for his lab to be certified under good manufacturing um, practices. And so as a result of that, he went through the pain of in, um, in incorporating GMP practices and getting that sort of his lab certified, which meant that we were all trained on what it is required from a documentation perspective and so and process perspective, uh, working under that GMP regulated environment. So um, I felt that it was a really good training uh, opportunity for me and it was, it was a real eye opener. So for mine, it yeah, came ahead. much later in life. I didn't come from the research side. So uh, as part of my work in trying to digitize a lot of the, uh, the output from our research going back to like from 1970 something onwards, realizing that we have like storage uh, units full of research products, uh, and final reports in paper form that sits there. Uh, and then needing to uh, digitize them and realize, yes, we do like, it's not just about saving the cost of the storage. It's like, these are knowledge that people have put in and they, they're unique knowledge that needs to get out there. And just saving them is not enough, right? People need to know about it, be able to discover it, right? Rosie talked about uh, serendipity uh, at the RLA launch, right? It's, that's what we want, right? We want the serendipitous discovery. And uh, Alexander talked about, yeah, discovery, like data discovery is one thing, but we also want to have these research and researchers and what they've done discoverable, right? It doesn't have to be for the zero, but mm. if they don't know about it, you don't know what you don't know. And you end up like in a limited pool of research, you may end up duplicating if people don't know about it and letting, needing it to see the light of day is what just struck me. So much later in life, unfortunately. Alexander? Um, I'll, I'll answer concisely, but translation is a continuum. You know something, what you've discovered has been translated to yourself. Your, your, your researchers in your team now know what you know, that's translation. And continuing how far along that continuum you push it is I think how we should look at translation. So I encourage everyone to just challenge themselves and continue saying, so what? And how much further can you push it down that translation pathway? So you're, you're doing it right now, if that's kind of where you're coming from in a personal perspective, but 
yeah, always challenge yourself. What more can you do? How much greater or what greater value can I get out of the research that I've done? Okay, what do you want to say? Uh, really quickly, so uh, I dropped out of high school because I thought I was making enough money back then not to worry, uh, which my kids will not be allowed to do that. But uh, <laughs> that's interesting. That gives you a very focused view on commerciality and trying to make something that makes money. So it was early for myself. Okay, good. I think uh, you got different perspectives, various people, and then my colleagues are really getting anxious that coffee is getting cold and we should really have a coffee break. <laughs> Colleagues are online and we'll take a 20 minute break and we'll come back now at 3.05. We'll come back at 3.25. Sydney time, please, if you happen to be from Perth or Adelaide, you know. We'll come back at 3.25. Thank you and yeah. please think about questions you can ask further. So welcome back and uh, welcome back to the colleagues, those are in the room as well as also colleagues, those are online as well. So now let us really, we've really talked about broader issues of the research commercialization. We covered part of it is data as well. So now let us focus a little bit on uh, the data aspects of it. And uh, because it's an ARDC event and then obviously data is very important and not only because it's ARDC event, it's also because of the fact it, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Whether you talk about AI or you talk about health issues or genomics data, phenomics data, astronomy data, and uh, national security point of view, data is really becoming a very important issue. So what do you see as a barrier for creating a data-intensive research and translation in Australia? Do we really see that we have uh, you know, a coherent uh, national research data policy and then we have a shortage of workers? And uh, in terms of, it, do you think that we should really have uh, a coordination body in the country which can really focus on the data and then make it, uh, you know, usable and findable, reoperatable, and various things? You know, they've so-called a fair cross fair data they call it or open data, and and uh, so and again that's something which we really important. And of course, uh, Tozi may say that oh, we are here, the ARDC is doing all that. But uh, of course, we need to look at in a much broader context about the data being you know, located in the government departments and uh, how to really extract that one out and also in the, sometimes in the companies and uh, you know, various things, you know, how, how do we really remove the barriers so that the data can be used broadly and uh, by multiple people and also that uh, it benefits the society broadly. Please, um, go ahead. I might start. So yeah, please. There's, um, particularly in healthcare, and I mentioned earlier that people don't want to be asked the same question by every health provider in the hospital when they go in for an admission. So to collect once and use many times yeah. is, is, a, is, a, is a key principle, and I'm sure it extends across all, all different um, sectors. Um, so, but when we think about that, it's not just within the public system, which um, obviously we have many available data sets, um, however, also the private sector. Yeah. So we've done some projects to link private and public data, um, identified and de-identified information. That is, again, a challenge of consent, a challenge of um, process, um, everyone knowing what's going on and once it gets in the right hands, making sure that it's governed and used appropriately. So there is definitely um, space in the sector to have someone overseeing how collaborative data sets are brought together, how they govern, and how they can be accessed. So yeah, I, I agree. Yep. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I mean, there's a huge push by the, the government for open data, right? So uh, the federal government pushing the open data initiative, uh, so on and so forth. But as uh, Alex said, right, so that's one part of the uh, equation. And even from that, uh, how do we move away from that ticking the box exercise? So, hey, I've, I've made some data available through my open data initiative, right? So lots of organizations start having this open data initiative. we we'll just put some in there. So that's one, let's put that aside for now. So there's an, another component where the private data sets that needs to actually be able to come out, right? And having that uh, either it's, whether it's private or public or open data, it's not helping us because we need to have a more onion level approach where like you're saying, uh, Alex is saying, how do we give assurance to those uh, public uh, private data sources that their data will be uh, 
looked after, meets the right requirement. You talked about governance, which is really important about giving assurance that the data will be uh, treated uh, in the proper way. Now, the next bit is that to make the data discoverable so that they exist, that people know that they exist, even if you cannot access them just by itself, right? And bringing them together and coming back to the first point is also, instead of, I guess, treating open data as a tick the box exercise that needs to be done, how do you embed that culture as uh, something that people are passionate about doing, right? We need to sort of like close the loop to say uh, what they're doing in the open data initiative and how it impacts and having those success stories of how they're helping would help, I guess, drive the passion of those who are actually doing this and not just rely on people's altruistic nature to do the open data initiatives. Okay. Thank you, Juju. Jai, of course, when you really work in a private company, of course, companies are really spending a lot of time in uh, doing a lot of research in, for, for example, a particular bio, pharmaceutical molecule, and you've designed lots of things. And then, of course, many of them didn't work. But even uh, if the data is not available to the general public or other companies, even that means they'll go and then put a lot of resources to trying to reinvent the wheel and other things. And what do you see as challenges uh, coming from the private sector and then also that uh, how do we make sure that that private data can be accessible mm -hmm. at the same time ultimately the companies those are providing that data is also seeing that they are really been good citizens for the uh, uh, global community as well yeah i think where the trend at the moment is uh, in in a lot of pharmaceutical in the pharmaceutical industry you're seeing a lot of ai drug discovery uh, led initiatives and um, interestingly um, in the area of um, proteomics, metabolomics, and, and so on and so forth, that kind of drug discovery element, they, they're using a lot of public data sets. Um, um, but from our perspective, there's one thing to actually uh, apply AI and other applications for uh, drug design and so on. But the what people forget to un, uh, or uh, fail to appreciate is the drug development process still remains the same. You know, you cannot get through get past the regulatory hurdles. You still need to go. So um, the questions are, yes, uh, AI might be able to unearth or uh, a, a novel uh, drug target or unearth uh, a novel um, drug de uh, design, uh, but it still needs to be validated. It still needs to go through the process. Can that particular uh, chemical compound be scaled up? Um, if it can be scaled up, yes, that takes the box. Uh, is there sufficient information to inform that they might potentially pass through phase one, phase two clinical trials, phase three clinical trials? So all that uh, it, um, drug development process cannot be undermined. It is, it is uh, baked into uh, that requirement. So while it's very attractive to use public data, the, and public data to some extent, there's data that is appealing to researchers and it, it helps uh, improve the quality of that research. It helps improve your grant, being able to access uh, grants. But there's also use of public data that might have value uh, by the industry itself. And there it takes you on a completely different trajectory that those applications. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And uh, what about you, Murray? Uh, one really quick thing. I'm finding it interesting with RLA, uh, who is deciding not to share data or is reluctantly sharing because you could almost make an argument and I'm probably uh, making a mistake in saying this, but like, why would you not want that particular data out there? Is it a sign that you are working with industry partners or funding sources that are not well connected in, across different research opportunities? Probably, yes. And that data being available and more people understanding those companies or sources are doing interesting things and more research is being attracted to them is good for those people, is good for Australia. And the people that are in the data that then have more opportunities to collaborate with people because they get to be understood as leaders or kind of interesting collaborators in that area. Um, I think it's a temporary problem, but it's also an interesting one to start to see. So as you know that the governments really provide a lot of R&D tax concessions for industry. And uh, 
So do you see that uh, if, uh, you know, as part of this R&D tax concessions, and then if uh, they provide the data, whatever they've got to the public access, then they'll be able to claim some of those tax concessions and other things. And do you think that governments can introduce some mechanisms which can really help bring the data out from the private sector to the public use, so thereby everybody can benefit? It's my favorite grants program. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'll say I'm on the committee that uh, manages that under ISA. Uh, I'm not here talking on their behalf. Yeah. I don't represent any opinion. Yeah. But the it's an unlimited pot of money, self-assessed with a wonderful track record of being relatively stable. Uh, the question I would ask is, um, like for the uh, RSP part of it, where you get a lower threshold for working with a registered uh, research service provider. Um, that's not a giant incentive to work together, but it's interesting what might be possible in understanding who different companies are working with. And then maybe that becomes something down the track of uh, Oz industry suggesting different partners or whatever else might be possible. So I think there's a role to play there that doesn't require leg legislation to change for collaboration premiums or things like that. Um, I'd, I'd ask one question, which is why don't more universities uh, spin out companies and take advantage of what they can as soon as you have a fledgling kind of IP that could be like very reasonably turned into a spin out and uh, in an interesting ways going to get more people working in that environment versus a normal academic academic environment take advantage of R&D tax incentive and external investors and other kind of funding sources that happens nowhere near as often as I think it should uh, and I think it's a way of looking at improving research funding that doesn't typically come into the conversation. So, I mean, whenever I talk to small companies where you're not using R&D tax concessions, they tell me the amount of bureaucratic process they have to go through. They do not have the resources to be able to go through the bureaucratic process. And that's a challenge which we need to think about how to really reduce the bureaucratic uh, hurdles so that even these startup companies will be able to really access those sorts of programs. So now let me come back and then we again, when you talk about R&D tax concessions, whenever we talk to the government, government always criticizes the universities not working with the industry. But the problem is that, uh, that's, a, that's a good good criticism. Okay, but, okay, we can keep that one there. But then how do you incentivize the industry to work with the universities if the industry doesn't have interest to work with the universities for whatever reason, how do we really change that one so that the both sides have incentives to work together? Anybody wants to comment on that? I'll have a, I'll have Please a go ahead. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I think that um, look, the reality is that in Australia, there are not many companies, uh, when you look at SMEs, that can afford to have an in-house research group. They're very expensive. It's yeah. too expensive for an SME to, to have that, even for a um, multinational company to have their own in-house uh, research opportunity, uh, re research group. So. Um, there is opportunity there, they are there. Um, the challenge is identifying the companies that um, are willing to have that appetite to do that research. Because um, it's not easy to encourage a company to say, hey, you know, let's go down the path of applying for an ARC industry fellowship grant, or let's go down the path of doing an AIC linkage. Now, if it's a company that's never done that before, you have to work alongside them. And so they have to have that, um, the resources, uh, they have to assign a person there uh, and so on to go down that path for you. So these are, there are several hurdles there, but they're not insurmountable. So it's, it's just a, a case of highlighting to the industry. And, and I've, I've seen where industry partners, um, I've discussed with them and they've never considered joining an ARC training center or an ARC center of excellence, they go, Oh, that's an interesting proposition. Uh, and it's, it's a case of understanding, well, what value does this scheme, what, what's the win-win for both parties? If we can't articulate that to the company, they're not going to come to the table. But when I've been able to do that, they more often than not are willing to uh, join forces. And perhaps once they, once they start to see that, they'll continue to to use that yes. avenue. And I think we've found that in the CRC model, perhaps also in the RDC model, that once we have 
participants in the CRC who understand that they can leverage greater skills and knowledge that's outside of their organization, you may think, oh, we'll just hire a data scientist. But really, when you get a data scientist that works at a university, they've got an, a network of skills and, and others that can help support them solve the, solve the industry problem or the government problem that, that you've got. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's right, because I've actually even called, called CEOs of uh, med tech companies and um, invited them to join uh, ARC training center. Mm -hmm. And often it's about uh, being able to explain what the value of that training center is for them, where are the key benefits and really in an in a email bullet point form saying, mm -hmm. well, if you, if you have a, a joint uh, or co-supervisor PhD student you know, after three or four years, that student will be tailored to your requirements and your skill sets and you'll be able to employ them. So being able to um, articulate all of that and in addition, not only the skill sets, but the, you might come up with a novel um, technology that you would not otherwise have done without partnering with university. So that, those kinds of win-win uh, value propositions are invaluable. Yeah, yeah I couldn't Did agree you... more, right? So Jay, you... Uh, mentioned that, that we need to be speaking the same language, right? Sometimes there's a uh, loss in translation between uh, academia and industry. And there's another component is also the, uh, the, the payoff time frames, right? Sometimes industry could be more technical in the sense of the challenges they're facing versus some of the, uh, the research uh, that may pay off uh, greatly in a, in a much longer time frame. It's then it's the, the need is to, right, so to make people speak the same language is to make the, the emergence happen. Like as an immigrant, you can, I can uh, uh, attest to the point that where you're immersed in a culture, you're able to understand it a lot more. It's that intersection between not just from both sides say, hey, you should be speaking industry language universities and industry should be speaking academia. The best way to make them speak is just to get them together and then just, I guess, force that interaction, right? Uh, I mean, just forcing alone may not work, but like have a proper incentive structure so that they'll work together and understand it. So, uh, so we're not uh, bringing a solution looking for a problem kind of thing. And that having that aha moment once they start speaking the same language is where the collaboration uh, would thrive. Yeah. I'd sort of like to add is that, is that increasingly I'm seeing in academia being very proactive in having industry specific days, you know, the food, you might have a food industry and then you bring together people from the food industry together to meet with researchers. So, so that dating game, so to speak, or a mining sector or a transport industry bring key transport people together but in med tech and so on. So I think these are, are where academia is now being very proactive. Yeah. I think there's a long road ahead, but yes. it's a starting point. I, th I think there need to be effort from both sides in order to make these things to work. As you know, that if you want to clap, you know, you need to have use the, both the hands. You know? So yeah. that means that you need to have both, uh, both need to come together. See, the value in proposition in terms of working together is an important one. So I think uh, that understanding is an important one as well. But thank you. In terms of now, if you really have to in now, I'll come back to data science again. And then mm -hmm. do you think that we got enough data science uh, train people in the country in order to be able to meet the you know, industry's needs? So, okay, I'll, I'll answer first, right? Uh, I don't know, but what we're finding is that, right, the future challenges that we have is even a lot less side of that before. If you look at, uh, when I mentioned the, the, the RDCs, right, so it was cut into 15 different commodity groups, like, We've got red meat, fish, we've got chicken and wild grains and stuff. Yep. But if you think about it, some of the newer, chat, like before, yes, if you're just looking at like chicken genomics versus pig and stuff, you can sort of like have, be in your own little lane ways and do your own thing. But a lot of the challenges that we're having in the future is cross-cutting. And you might even say it's even broader than agriculture and so on. And the skill sets that are going to help in this area is also not just in fisheries or even broader agriculture or even just like uh, in a resource sector for instance right and most of those and there were a lot of those coming from the data ai data uh, data science data engineering how which makes me wonder right so we will we have enough 
in the pipeline where we need to compete with the likes of Facebook trying to get us to uh, doom, doom scroll a little bit longer versus trying to help that, uh, having that person look at a fisheries problem and try to solve it. Even if there is enough in terms of total quantum, we will be fighting for it to get uh, the right skills to be looking at our problems to help us solve it. So the, I think we would need to be producing more, although I can't say whether we we're at a deficit, but I think we need more, we will be needing more, definitely. Good, okay, thank you. Now let me come to the infrastructure side of things. High performance computing. So of course we are going to really do more and more research and more and more data. And that means we need to have the high performance computing capabilities and then the data capabilities need to go hand in hand. Do you think as a nation, are we investing enough in the high performance computing and then as far as I know that I haven't really seen any major strategies in terms of high performance, high performance computing and data capabilities as a new initiatives by the government or so. And what are your thoughts? And do you think that we should be really looking at it as a national strategy of high performance computing for the future? I can start by saying, I don't know. I see the bills though that we get for them. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's high, so probably. <laughs> I guess my question to the question is, right? So are we, with high performance computing, are we looking at sovereign access to high performance computing and data storage? Or are we talking about developing novel uh, research and technology to build it? I would say the access, the sovereign access to that will be of higher importance than trying to compete with other semiconductor manufacturers on how to do it, right? Uh, we've got a, a, a broader, like a more and more, uh, I guess, uh, uh, data centers that's being set up here in Australia to uh, address the cloud storage and cloud compute needs, et cetera. But to, in my view, it should be seen as a, uh, a, a sovereign risk where if we were to lose access to these things, right? And how do you ensure it so that there's enough computing power, not now, but in the future, and that's coming in, because if we're importing all of that in, right, we become, we can become at risk of any kind of sanctions, for instance. Not that there's any geopolitical risk that's going to happen, but making sure having access to these things is critical. You can see that happen with like uh, the US sanctions on China, for instance, in terms of some of the semiconductors, that would be a, uh, uh, I guess, geopolitical tool that countries can use and for us to ensure we have access to high performance computing now and in the future will be critically important. Yeah, when I asked the question, that's more of the access to those facilities yep. Yep. and then uh, data centers as well as also to the high performance computing, because if the future is going to AI and various data technologies are going to play such an important role in terms of decision making to developing industries, and even existing industries will be using that one much and more and more, and then those capabilities becomes important. At and least that's that's my thinking. That's I would okay. like to get your perspectives because you are the at the cold face of really dealing with this one every day. And to add to that, right? So I see actually the production of clean and green energy to be a critical factor here. A lot of these data centers and high performance computing consume considerable amount of energy, right? And what will happen is that apart from the data sovereignty and the computing sovereignty aside, most of where these things are set up will follow clean and green energy and cheap clean and green energy. If we wanna be at the forefront of this area, having access to clean, green, cheap energy would give us, puts us at a competitive advantage where instead of putting somewhere, uh, uh, I guess close, somewhere that is closer to the market, it may make Australia the data center uh, location of choice. Okay. And it's something that you can't just take away and move out that quickly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, any questions now? I think I'll open the, I know that we're running out of time. And uh, so maybe my colleague there. Yeah. 
Okay, also online questions as well. And first we'll go to the colleague in the room and then we'll go to the online one later, Robin. Thank you. Yeah. circumstances or sort of governments, organizations, institutions that might be shooting uh, interesting or working well in this area that could be used as a bit of inspiration or um, you know, look like they might be working in a small way that could be translated to a sort of Australian situation. So for people on online, the question is that are there any best practice examples in the world which we can really you know, benefit from? Yeah. Any comments, colleagues? I think the comparisons become kind of depressing pretty quickly when you like it's so easy to get jealous of you know random countries that's spending huge amounts of money on something that you're doing. Um, I think Australia is a different economic climate to the rest of the world. Like we have a lack of economic complexity because we're blessed with the resources that we have and the kind of economies that we do. So I think those comparisons are really hard to find in a meaningful way. Uh, I think appreciating more the things that do perform well in Australia and are unique to Australia and the experts in Australia that are able to suggest the things that can move things forward. I'd love to see more of that. Um, and that, you know, if I see another consultant that's rolled in from overseas to give advice on how to change things, like we do a little bit too much of that, I think. And I think there's in this room alone, probably a long list of great ideas of things that Australia could do to meaningfully move the needle that get ignored. But I'm not sure how other people feel. I, I think that one of the, the advantages that countries like uh, UK have uh, over us is that uh, in the medical area, in the clinical area, the NHS, uh, so we, they have a one-tier healthcare system. We have a through our federated environment, a, a two-tier healthcare system. It's state and, and territory based. So our um, access to data and, and the volume of our data is state based and worse off, it's even hospital site based. It's not consolidated aggregated data sets uh, from our perspective. So um, that is a huge disadvantage for us because if we are allowed, allowed to uh, apply AI capabilities uh, on these types of data sets. Well, well, quality as well as quantity matters in terms of the data sets itself. And um, what's even more important in the healthcare sector is from a disease perspective, uh, patient populations are stratified. So when you, when you stratify them into subtypes and subgroups and genotypes, your quality of your data set gets even sm smaller and smaller. So we don't have that luxury that you know, a countries like NHS has, uh, and even if it's not um, one country approach, like in the US, they have a huge population uh, approach. So their their states, so so the commercial company uh, companies like Kaiser Permanente, they they can afford to apply AI on a rich data set because it's high volume, high quality, just purely on the population size. So there are certain the, in the healthcare sector that's kind of where I see some of the advantages that some of our overseas uh, counterparts have over us. Might just Please, go back to that down, comment. Um, one thing that we're looking into more and more, and that's, and that's something that's done overseas, is synthetic data sets to try and fill the gaps, essentially. So that's, I um, guess, making a, a safe and secure version of, of a healthcare data set, um, knowing that you've got gaps because we don't have um, one single record for a certain human being, for example. And how can we fill that? So even though that may not be enough to get through clinical trials or the new model or something that we're training, um, you can at least all the preparatory work and, and build out the models and the solutions so that it's ready and it's at a high tier, you know, technology readiness level, for example, before you get access to a more richer source of data sets. So mm. there's little things that they do do overseas that we can start to bring into Australia, I think, um, that can support our environment that we're currently working with. So in terms of the question of what uh, learnings from overseas would we like to see? Like for me, uh, I'd like to see more uh, public-private partnerships. And if you look at uh, countries like the Nordic countries, for instance, for such a small population side, they do punch above their weight significantly in terms of innovation, GDP, well-being, et cetera. And one of the things that I keep being surprised about is their collaborative approach to a lot of challenges, right? And it, we have a federal system, and also we do sometimes more likely than not to be antagonistic and be challenging each other. But 
collaboration, working together towards a shared goal does more good than harm. And these kinds of private and public partnerships, universities, industry, et cetera, would be something that would be really good for Australia. Yep, I couldn't agree more, Joe. And maybe questions from online. Robin, please. Okay, uh, can you hear that? Um, yes. So Josh Clough online has asked, uh, this refers to some of the earlier conversations. Uh, how can universities, RDCs, CRCs, research infrastructure facilities, and others with a focus on research translation better collaborate? And what are the challenges when it comes to collaboration? Good question as a follow-up on collaboration aspects of it. Who would like to take it? Wow. Uh, if I, uh, I guess if, 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 I, uh, if it were easy, be done already. Uh, I guess, yeah, it, it's, it's something not easy. I think it's, we are, uh, are too often than not like uh, taking a defensive position and saying that, hey, like parochialism, for instance, trying to say like, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing things. I guess we really need to start breaking down the barriers in terms of like whether it's RDC, CRC, we're all doing similar things, right? Even the, like you could even argue it's the, the federal system. We've got jurisdiction states that manage fisheries. They're all doing the same or very similar work. Fish don't care about borders, right? So you're managing their stock, but Queensland say, well, we'll do it this way. And New South Wales does it this way. And I think there's a flow down from, oh, okay, like we're just different enough, right? So we're focusing too much on the little bit that makes us different rather than concentrating on the vast magnitude that makes us similar and the same, right? And if we can start changing our mindset and looking at what makes us more uh, alike than what makes us different, and that would go a long way than saying that, hey, just because I'm wearing a slightly different color shoe than a someone else who's also black. Now, we could look at the commonalities. And that's something that we need to sort of like start uh, pushing in terms of a uh, culture change. Good, okay, thank you. And I hope uh, the question has been well answered. In fact, collaboration and cooperation is the way to go. And uh, so again, uh, as I said, fish don't see the boundaries and viruses don't see the boundaries and yep. science doesn't see the boundaries. That means working together is the best way to really move forward. Yep. And uh, again, uh, data doesn't see the boundaries as well. You know? and so anyway, with that, and I think now I would like to invite back uh, one and only CEO of the ARDC, uh, Rosie Hicks, please. So please join yep. me one time. Thank you for the entire panel as well. Thank you, Jagadish. That, that's a steep step for me. Um, so, just a few words in conclusion. Um, Jagadish, we've had a bit of a play on the 20 years. I was looking for a photo 20 years old in my office this afternoon. Um, I didn't find one, you're safe. But uh, what we did find was papers on research translation dating back to 2013, dating back to 2005. The opening comments that we really haven't shifted the dial on this in a very long time, uh, evidenced by the filing cabinets in my office. They're not a patch on Jagadish's desk. The answer's on that desk somewhere. Um, but today we have had a really fantastic discussion right the way across the spectrum of issues related to research translation. Uh, of course, looking at the data specifically, Jojo, you have spoken uh, a number of times about the importance of being able to discover data for research, to be able to find data. Alessandro, you spoke to us about the importance of governance for health data and privacy concerns, things we need to think about when we are accessing the data. Jilly, you told us that we need to speak the same language. I'm going to say that's interoperable. Yep. <laughs> Luke, participation from the audience. You spoke about researchers' concerns for the reuse of their data and how um, concerns stemming from AI are going to 
give people pause when it comes to sharing their data. I hope not too much. Um, but yes, between us, we've all put together fair data. Did you spot that? <laughs> I think so. But Murray, you gave us that sense of urgency, the time horizons that we're facing with AI. So they're all a concern. Um, but one of the bits that really stood out to me was the recognition of knowledge as a product, right? I think that's really important, particularly in our research infrastructure world. Um, might not always be free, but certainly that concept of valuing knowledge as a product and products are no good if they just stay hidden in the, the warehouse, right? Products are only useful if they're out there, if we're sharing them or buying them, uh, sharing them in our case and really using those products. So it's use that is critical of this knowledge. Um, a quote I heard someone say yesterday related to data at the time, the value was in the use of data, not the possession. It's the same with knowledge. Uh, all of us have come together because we're interested in research translation. We want to uh, shift that dial. Fabulous question from online at the end. If we knew the answer to that, we could go straight to the drinks. We don't. Uh, we really have to look at how we are going to build these collaborations. But I really hope that this afternoon's event has made a small contribution to advancing us on that pathway. And my sincere and heartfelt thanks to such an amazing panel, a fantastic facilitator. And I will also thank the ARDC team that as always have put together a fantastic event for us all. So I actually, I think it's congratulations all round. Thank you.